I'm Bob Shin. I'm a neurologist here at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital, and I work in the neurology department doing multiple sclerosis and neuro-ophthalmology. In the MS clinic, I see mostly patients who either have multiple sclerosis or are trying to figure out whether they might have MS or not. Neuro-ophthalmology is a pretty small subspecialty, but people can have visual issues that are not due to cataracts or retinal detachments or glaucoma, but due to a problem with the nervous system, so the optic nerves or the brain or brain stem. So when it's a neurological cause for visual problems, that's what neuro-ophthalmology is. Sometimes it can be pretty scary when you're seeing a doctor for the possibility of multiple sclerosis, or maybe someone's been diagnosed with, with multiple sclerosis and isn't sure what the next step is. Um, so I think a lot of what I do is try to provide information because I think a lot of um, the uncertainty that accompanies MS is what can be particularly frightening. If you become more familiar with MS, you know there's a lot of technology that goes into the diagnosis. So there's a lot of MRI, sometimes there's blood work, for some people lumbar puncture, so sometimes there's a lot of laboratory data. Um, but I think what's important is you really have to kind of pay attention to the human side of it. So the foundation of MS diagnosis is still talking to the patient, so the history, finding out the story and what the symptoms are, uh, and the hands-on examination. So actually examining the patient carefully, really literally from head to toe, uh, to see what's going on. MedStar Georgetown University Hospital actually has a very large MS center, so we have five different neurologists who are specializing in treating multiple sclerosis. It's one of, if not the largest, MS center in the region. And we're really trying to provide a more integrated, sort of holistic approach to treating MS, whether it's neurology, but also physical therapy, maybe um, urogynecologic issues, um, sometimes mental health support as well um, can be provided. So I, I would say that's what we really bring to the table as opposed to seeing you know, an otherwise um, excellent uh, individual specialist. Not long ago, there were no treatments for multiple sclerosis. So when I started medical school, I learned about this as a disease that occurred um, it affects young people more than older people and affects women more than men. You know, these were all the demographics that I learned about. And then the lecture ended, you know, there wasn't really anything that could be done. So it's really only been since the mid-90s that we've had treatments for MS. So I would say the most gratifying thing for me in my career has being able to watch um, our ability to treat MS grow and to even be a part of some of that research that's resulted in treatment options for you know, literally hundreds of thousands of Americans and, and millions of people worldwide. Multiple sclerosis is a disease that we say is autoimmune or immune mediated. So the immune system, we all have one, it's to protect us from infections, bacteria and viruses. Um, but it's supposed to not attack ourselves. It should recognize ourselves and leave it alone. Uh, sometimes uh, the immune system gets mixed up. So if the immune system's mixed up and it attacks your joints, we might call that rheumatoid arthritis. Or if it was mixed up and it attacked your gut, we might call that Crohn's disease. Or it could attack your skin and your kidneys, we might call that lupus. If your immune system is mixed up and attacks your brain and spinal cord, your central nervous system, that's what multiple sclerosis is. We still don't know actually what causes MS. So there are many theories. Uh, it could be environmental. Uh, it could be maybe an infection. It could be something genetic. Um, the truth is we really don't know what causes it. Um, we don't think that people are born with multiple sclerosis. We think that it's something that's picked up later in life, um, whether it's because different people have different predispositions to it or because they bump into something that triggers it, honestly still isn't known. The hard thing about MS is that there's so many symptoms. So since, as I mentioned, MS affects the brain and spinal cord, if you think about anything that the brain and spinal cord controls, that can be messed up by MS. So that could be vision, it could be memory, it could be uh, numbness or pain, it can be weakness or incoordination, it could be bladder difficulties, sexual dysfunction, it can affect your mood. So really almost anything like that can be part of multiple sclerosis.
the symptoms, I'm sure, uh, if you thought about it, are not that specific, meaning people can have those symptoms for a lot of different reasons. Having a symptom like numbness or a symptom like fatigue doesn't automatically mean that you have multiple sclerosis. But certainly um, having a number of different symptoms um, in a particular pattern might suggest it's worth getting that checked out. So we don't know exactly what causes MS, but we do know that some people are, are more prone than others. So for instance, it is more common in the US and Canada among Caucasian Americans and African Americans um, than it might be near the equator in a different country or, or maybe for an Asian American like myself. Um, so there it does appear to be a demographic effect. Um, we also know that it affects women more than men. So probably two to three times as many women than men have MS. Plenty of men have MS, but it is more common in women. Um, it also affects people in a young age group. So we typically say people are diagnosed between the ages of 20 and 40, which is really, you know, young adulthood or the prime of your life, as opposed to some neurologic diseases that might affect people who are more elderly. So MS is definitely a disease of the young. Uh, it's a disease more of women than, than men, um, and uh, diseases more of, uh, you know, people in this area. So people in the U.S. and Canada and uh, Northern Europe. What's interesting is pregnancy actually seems to be a little bit protective against MS during the time of pregnancy. Um, so women with MS, and that's a lot of my patients, absolutely can have a family if that's what they want to do. Um, it's important to work with a doctor because if we are treating the multiple sclerosis with certain medicines, we may want to stop those um, before uh, the woman gets pregnant. Um, and then consider restarting the medicine after the, you know, after having had the baby. But absolutely, um, having MS doesn't prevent someone from having a family if they want to. We don't 100% know what causes MS, um, and we don't know if there might be a genetic factor. But what I can say is that most of my patients, men or women who have MS, um, their children aren't necessarily going to have MS. So it's not something that's directly passed on. Um, I would say if someone has MS, um, the risk of their child having MS is maybe only 1 or 2%, so it's very unlikely. Um, even if two identical twins you know, come to my office and one has MS, the odds are actually against the other twin having MS. So it's not purely genetic. It's not something that people get directly from their parents or would pass on directly to their children. There is no genetic test. People are looking hard for different kinds of markers, biomarkers or genetic markers that would help identify people at risk for MS or who have MS, and we don't have that yet. Um, there's definitely some intriguing research in the early stages, but nothing, um, there's no commercial test right now that would help us in that way. MS is definitely treatable now. Um, but as I mentioned, not long ago it was not. So even into the early 90s, we had no treatments for MS. So MS has been known about for literally centuries, but we had no treatment for MS until the maybe mid-1990s. Um, so a lot of times if people have heard of MS, they might be, um, you know, have a very negative impression because maybe they knew somebody who was very disabled from MS or greatly affected by MS, especially if they were diagnosed in the 70s or 80s or early 90s. But it is a different ball game now. We're in the 21st century. We have 13 different FDA-approved brands of medication to treat MS, and we're getting better at treating it as time goes by. Um, the most recent generation of MS medications is actually quite effective. Um, we haven't cured MS yet, um, but uh, I actually can see quite a difference in how people with MS are doing now that we have the option to treat them, especially if we diagnose and treat them early on. Yeah, there's, there's definitely uh, an emphasis on early diagnosis. Um, when treatments first became available, it wasn't really clear, you know, should we wait till something's happened? Like how early should we treat it? But um, we've now, we now have about really two decades of experience, um, which have told us that actually the earlier people are treated, the better they do in the long run. So getting that diagnosis made accurately and early is very important. You know, in some sense, we always say that every MS patient is different, but um, you're absolutely right. The majority of MS patients start out experiencing episodes 
of neurological problems. We might use the term relapses or exacerbations um, to represent a new neurological symptom coming on. It might last for days to weeks, maybe even it could take months for recovery. Um, and these episodes occur at different points in time. So it's sort of episodic. Um, so that's the most common type of MS. Um, it is more rare, but it is possible for people to have a gradually worsening course. We call that progressive MS. But most MS patients will fall into what we call the relapsing um, category of MS. Uh, that is the most uh, common and, and perhaps milder form of MS. I do get asked that question a lot, especially when you know, we first make the diagnosis of MS. And I think a lot of that stems from people's experience. Maybe they had a relative, a grandparent, somebody they knew, someone in the neighborhood, someone at church who had multiple sclerosis and was very affected by that. And they may have a vision of MS, meaning you know, someone who's in a wheelchair having a lot of neurological problems. And although we haven't cured MS, I have to say, I'm happy to say that we see that happening a lot less often. Um, remember, we did not have treatments before the early to mid-90s, so unfortunately there was a lot of disability that could accumulate untreated. Uh, now that we have the ability to treat MS, I think we're doing a much better job at keeping people out of that condition. In fact, my goal for most of my MS patients is to shut down the disease as completely as possible. I want them to have no MS attacks or relapses. Uh, I don't want them to develop progression or disability over time, uh, and I want their MRIs to look unchanged. I don't want them to have new spots or problems on their MRI. And, and we can't always achieve that, but it is, a, a, I would say, a realistic goal for most of our patients now. Even though we're doing a lot better at treating MS, we haven't cured MS completely. So um, one of the goals is, of course, to still figure out what the cause was in the first place and how we can try to prevent it. For example, uh, in the news, you may hear a lot about vitamin D. So we've only recently become aware that very low vitamin D levels, one are common, but also might increase the risk of MS, for example. So that's an area that's of interest. Um, another thing that we're looking at is not just preventing MS attacks, which is what we're getting better at doing, but how can we undo the damage that's already been done? And honestly, we're not quite as good at that currently, but there are some interesting strategies. Uh, strategies to see if we can um, heal the damage that's been done by doing something we call remyelination, um, bringing back the myelin that was damaged. Um, and then of course, we can always get better and more effective treatment. So if we could shut it down more completely and more patients, um, you know, that's really the direction we're heading. When we get into sort of more the nitty gritty about MS, when we talk about those episodes of MS, what we think uh, is happening is that there are areas of inflammation. So um, whenever we get cut or bruised, you'll see swelling, that's inflammation. Um, and that can occur within the brain and spinal cord. So areas of inflammation cause damage to parts of the nervous system. So our nerves are like, we say like wires, you know, they're interconnected like a really advanced computer. Um, those wires are insulated, so to keep them from touching each other, they're insulated by some, with something called myelin. When MS attacks, that inflammation damages the myelin, and that results in bare spots or even might break those nerves, break those wires. So when we talk about remyelination, we're talking about putting that insulation back on where it needs to be, or, or maybe, with luck, in the future, figuring out a way to heal the damaged nerves um, and, and help them to reconnect. Well, uh, each of the drugs acts differently, actually. So that's another interesting thing is as we've learned more about the immune system and how MS can affect the brain and spinal cord, we've come up with many different strategies to treat MS. So there isn't really one way it's done. But in general, I would say the general theme is to take the uh, confused part of the immune system, the overactive part of the immune system, and calm that down so that it doesn't continue to attack um, what it shouldn't, meaning the brain and spinal cord. definitely double vision. Um, any kind of visual problem, blurred vision, distorted vision that doesn't have any eye explanation, you know, the eye doctor can't find anything wrong. Um, people can have unequal pupils, for instance, or unusual eye movements. Um, all of those sort of fall under neuro-ophthalmology.